Hey dude, Mr. Burger here. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about printmaking, if that's cool. Hey, let me know if you're interested uh, in rapping. Thanks, Duder. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Well, hello, scholars, and welcome back to yet another episode of Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and master educator attempting to bring you the best in our historical content. If you like this one, please interact with it. Thank you very much. Ain't nobody trying to hear that shit you talking. When we talk about art and media, we're talking about paint, we're talking about drawing, we're talking about sculpture, we're talking about all kinds of different things that artists use to make their artwork. But one of the things that I have yet to hit on that really needs to be addressed is printmaking. Printmaking is a really uh, a process that's been around, boy, just about forever. And so today what I'd like to do is to get into some of the, the most common processes in printmaking. The first thing we might notice about the print, Retroactive 1, Kennedy, is the layering of images. A blue depiction of John F. Kennedy with the green necktie, the green square Polaroid photo of a glass of water, the parachuting astronaut. This artwork with the overlapping images, this seemingly random composition, creates a colorful visual commentary on a media saturated with culture, struggling to come to grips with the new TV era. This layering of images resembles in some ways the process of memories. Each of our memories inhibits a layer of our mind. In the visual arts, a print is a multiple of a work of art a series of nearly identical pieces, usually printed on paper. Prints are made from a matrix, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more, which an artist may create out of metal, wood, or stone. The artist then supervises the printing of a group of images from this matrix that is called an addition. Nearly all original prints are numbered to indicate a total number of prints pulled or printed in that edition. So, the numerical 6 over 50 would indicate that the print was the sixth print pulled out of an edition of 50 total prints. An artist makes prints called proofs at various stages to see how the image on the matrix is developing. When the artist feels that the stages are satisfactory, the artist makes a few prints of their own to record for their own record keeping and personal use. These prints are marked with an AP, meaning artist's proof. One of the best definitions of an original print comes from June Wayne. She says, it is a work of art, usually on paper, which has siblings. They all look alike. They were all made at the same time from the same matrix, the same creative impulse, and they are all originals. The fact that there are many of them is irrelevant. As we explore printmaking in this video, we will explore various methods, noting unique characteristics of each. Traditionally, these methods are divided into four basic categories. Relief, intaglio, lithography, and stencil. Right now, in 2021, artists are using these old methods in new ways. My good people, I think there's a lesson here for all of us. If we think about fingerprints, a rubber stamp, or tire marks on the pavement, we might already understand how relief printing works. In a relief process, the printmaker cuts away all of the parts of the print surface not meant to carry ink. The carved surface is then inked, and the ink is transferred to the paper with pressure. The oldest relief prints are woodcuts. The woodcut process lends itself to design with bold black and white contrast. The image bearing the block of wood is a plank cut along the grain. 
Woodcut editions are limited to a couple of hundred because the relief edges begin to deteriorate with the repeated pressure. Woodcut originates in China, where the desire to spread the Buddhist religion greatly influenced the type of prints that were being produced. Soon this process would spread to Japan, gaining huge popularity in the 17th through the 19th centuries. Japanese woodblock prints are made through a complex process that uses multiple blocks to achieve these various color effects. Because they were much cheaper than paintings, these prints were the preferred art of the middle class, and the subject matters of these works were so various with works that depicted nightlife, landscapes, portraits, and so forth. These Japanese prints were among the first objects of Asian art to find favor among European artists and many of the Impressionists and Post-Impressionist artists were strongly influenced by these printings, including Cezanne, Manet, Monet, and Vincent van Gogh. Oh, bribes, bribes, bribes. Color woodcuts are usually printed with multiple wood blocks. As with most printmaking techniques, when more than one color is used, each color is on a separate block that are printed one after the next, and they must be carefully lined up or registered to ensure that the colors will match up in the exact place they're supposed to to line up for the final print. Renowned Japanese artist Hokusai made some of the world's best color woodcuts. He worked in close collaboration with highly skilled carvers to realize his final prints. For each of his woodcuts, he would transfer as many as 20 blocks that would be lined up in a certain order and Hokusai's print, The Wave, a towering mountain of water, threatened some tiny fishermen out on their boats. The rhythmic curves of the churning sea even dwarf Mount Fuji in the background. Now the details and the quality of this print are very different from the rough woodcut we see created by Emil Nolda titled Prophet. Each cut in this block is an expressive look at an old man's face and revealing the character of the wood and the woodcut process. Nolda's direct approach is a part of a long tradition in German printmaking. A more modern development in relief printing is linoleum cut. Artists start with a rubbery, synthetic surface of linoleum. And just like a woodcut, the artist will gouge out the areas that are intended to not take ink. An example of linoleum cut, or lino cut, is this work by Bill Thick. He is a contemporary printmaker from North Carolina. His large-scale prints are all generated by carving these detailed designs on a large sheet of linoleum. I just don't want to catch him in bed with a goblin. Intaglio printing is the opposite of relief, where areas below the surface hold the ink. The word intaglio comes from Italian, meaning to cut into. The image to be printed is cut or scratched or etched into a metal surface. To make an intaglio print, the printmaker first places the ink on the surface of the plate and then wipes the surface clean, leaving only the ink that is down in the grooves. Damp paper is then placed onto the inked plate, which is then pressed between a couple of rollers. The damp paper will pick up the ink off the grooves, maintaining their place on that damp paper. The pressure of the rollers creates a plate mark around the edge of the image. Intaglio printmaking was traditionally done from polished copper, but now zinc, steel, aluminum, and even plastics are used in this process. Engraving and etching are two principal intaglio processes. To make an engraving, the artist cuts lines into a polished surface. To see the best examples of engraving, one should examine the Northern Renaissance artist Albrecht Dürer, considered one of the greatest engravers of all time. One can look at his Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse or Night, Death, and the Devil to get a real good indication of the quality of work that he was producing. There are thousands of fine lines that define the shapes, masses, spaces, values, and textures that are depicted within these very small pieces of art. The precision of each of these lines is absolutely incredible. He's a legend.
Another type of intaglio is etching. This process begins with the preparation of a metal plate. The artist will take a plate, usually copper or zinc, and they put a coating of wax or varnish that will resist acid. The artist then draws easily through the coating with a pointed tool, exposing the metal with each stroke. For the final step, this plate is immersed in nitric acid. The acid bites into the plate where the metal is exposed, creating grooves that vary with the strength of the acid and also calculated by the time of exposure to the acid. Because it's a little bit easier to produce, etched lines are generally more relaxed and irregular than engraved ones. We can see the difference in the line quality between an etching and an engraving by comparing the lines of Rembrandt's Christ Preaching and the line quality of Durer's engravings. In this etching by Rembrandt, we see a wide range of values, mostly created through hatching or a crisscross of lines. Skillful use of light and shadow draws the attention toward the Jesus figure. Now etching and engraving date back to the 15th and 16th centuries, but lithography was not developed until the 19th century. Lithography is a surface or planographic printing process that is based on the natural propelling between oil and water. Lithography lends itself to a direct manner of working because the artist draws an image onto a surface of stone or plate without any cutting. Its directness makes lithography very fast and somewhat more flexible than other methods of printing. Using lino crayons, little pencils, or a greasy liquid called tash, the artist draws an image on a flat, fine-grained Bavarian limestone or on a metal surface. After the image is complete, it is chemically treated with a gum solution and a small amount of acid to fix it on the upper layer of the stone. The surface is then dampened with water and is inked. The water in the blank areas repels the oil-based ink, but it adheres to the greasy areas of the image. As in other printing processes, when the surface is covered with paper and run through a press, the image is transferred onto the paper. Because the surface remains intact, lithographic stones or plates can be reused after cleaning. Before the advent of the modern day printing press, it was used to develop illustrations for newspapers, posters, or even high school yearbooks. But I mean, how do you know this stuff? I know because I'm middle-aged man. <laughs> Honari Damier is one of the first really great lithographic artists. He made his career making satirical and documentary lithographs for French newspapers. In Rue Transnonaire, Daumier carefully reconstructs a horrible event that occurred during the riot in Paris on April 15, 1834. A militia claimed that a shot was fired from a building on this Paris street. So the militia responded by entering the apartment and killing all of the occupants. The scene unfolds around the center figure, but we start to notice that he's tangled up in his bed sheets. Although it might not be immediately apparent, this dead man is lying on top of a dead baby. Two additional bodies lie on either side of the picture, while the bed fills up the rest of the composition. Shortly after the production of this particular poster, the government of King Louis Philippe passed censorship laws that forbid any political character critical of the monarchy. Somebody got out of the wrong bed today. The freedom and directness of lithography make the techniques ideal for the spontaneous and witty approach of Henri Toulouse Lautrec. For the better part of the 1890s, this prolific artist created more than 300 lithographs. Many of them were designed as posters for advertising everything from the Moulin Rouge to bicycles. He was famous for creating posters of the cabaret singers and dancers that he met at the famous Parisian nightclub, the Moulin Rouge. His innovations in lithography including splatter techniques, large formats, and a vivid use of color would greatly influence both lithography and graphic design in the 20th century. The popular lithographic poster La Goulai was a simple sketch depicting the famous dancers La Goulai herself and No Bones Valentine. The sketch was incorporated as a key element in a strong lithograph. 
created with bold colors, solid outlines, and textures created with the liquid touche. The artist used lines and curves to bring the viewer's eye into the center of the design. In its simplest terms, a stencil is a sheet with a design cut out of it. Paint that is on top or sprayed over the sheet transfers the design to the picture plane. Stencils are a quick way to make lettering or repeated designs on a wall. Stencils are a favored method of creation by street artists who communicate through pictorial messages because they permit a fast fabrication without the need of redrawing it each time. One of these artists is Kim McCarthy, a Seattle-based artist who also uses the alias Soul. Her urban Buddha shows many repeated patterns in the background that she has achieved with stencils by using blue and green paint. The drawback to using stencils is shading is not real possible, only positive and negative spaces. She has overcome this difficulty by adding many colors and brush strokes, as well as paint, drips, and splatters. Oh, really? You learned that in med school that you obviously didn't get into? Screen printing is a refinement of the technique of stenciling. Early in the last century, stencil techniques were improved by adhering a stencil to a screen made of a silk fabric stretched across a frame. With a rubber squeegee, ink can then be pushed through the fabric onto an open area. Screen printing is well suited for the production of images with areas of uniform color. Each separate color requires a different screen, but registering the print is relatively simple. Screen printing thus lends itself to poster production. Many social movements have allied themselves with silk screen artists that have spread the word about their causes. For example, Esther Hernandez made hundreds of posters that asserted Chicano identity and denounced the working conditions of many Mexican-American laborers. Her screen print, Sun Mad, is both an excellent example of screen art and a memorable protest against the usage of pesticides. The latest development of screen printing is a photographic stencil or photo screen achieved by attaching light sensitive gelatin onto the screen fabric. An example of this is from the 1986 series Cowboys and Indians where Andy Warhol creates a series of 250 screen prints like this example John Wayne. You can call me a dirty son of a bitch. The photo comes from a movie still for the movie The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. A series of screens would have been fabricated to create the various colors and layering that we see in this artwork. Now, the photo itself was used without the permission of John Wayne or the movie production or whatever, so this was a problem that had to be resolved. So the solution was that the Andy Warhol Foundation gifted one of these prints, as well as seven others, to the John Wayne family in exchange for them to be able to have the rights. The John Wayne work was sold at auction in 2011 for $17,675. Digital technologies have altered printmaking at a basic level by eliminating the tangible plate. Graphic design encompasses a wide range of design work, especially in the world of print media. Album art is a branch of print media that most of us can identify with. The Beatles' Abbey Road from 1969, or Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon 1973, or the Led Zeppelin self-titled album from 1969. Now for me, one of the albums that stands out is the In Utero album, which was the third and final studio album that was released by my favorite band Nirvana in 1993. The art director for the project was Robert Fisher, who had designed all of Nirvana's releases for DGC. Most of the ideas for the artwork of the album and the related singles came from the frontman of the group, Kurt Cobain, which Cobain himself described as sex and women and in utero and vaginas and birth and death. The front cover of the album is an image of an anatomical teaching aid, a mannequin with transparent skin. They then have these angel wings that are superimposed onto this mannequin. The collage used on the back of the album had been set up on the floor of Cobain's living room and was then photographed after an unexpected call from Cobain. According to the photographer, Charles Peterson, one Sunday afternoon Kurt calls me up and he's like, hey, I want you to take that picture now. I rummaged for whatever film I had in the fridge and went over. 
So basically, Cobain's got the whole thing laid out on the floor where he has to shoot from the top down to capture the image that is then taken back and worked on digitally with song titles and symbologies from the Woman's Dictionary of Symbols and Sacred Objects book placed around the outside edges. So hopefully that gives you an idea of some of the printmaking processes and you have a better understanding of relief, intaglio, lithography, and stencil work and the basic process that goes into each one of these i tell you i love that story thanks for watching god bless the internet